and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm curious what brought people to this talk, because honestly, all of us are a little bit excited, but at the same time confused and challenged by this very broad um, and uh, sort of historically rich um, concept. And to prepare for that, we even had a toast of champagne backstage just to quiet our nerves. And um, the, the goal of this conversation really is not to give you any clarity of what this, what communism means or what communism would mean in an artistic practice, but to open up all kinds of questions and uh, trajectories and unexpected confluences. And I think that will be quite rewarding and fruitful for you. Um, so to start, I would actually like to share a story that is also an ongoing research that I think really resonates well with this topic. And you may have seen some of the images um, that was looping uh, in the beginning. Um, in 1994, this New York-based artist called Mark Tenzi, who practices this hyper-realism, but rather than represent figures, he really paints ideas, and a lot of that in response to critical theory and philosophical discourse at the time. And at th he, uh, in this year, he actually organized an exhibition of four Chinese artists who were living in New York at the time. None of them were uh, as established as they are today, but they are quite famous and big, and these four Chinese artists include Chen Danqing, Liu Xiaodong, Yu Hong, who spoke so brilliantly at the feminist aesthetics panel yesterday, and Ni Jun. Um, and the way they were introduced were actually through the introduction of Komar Melame, this uh, sort of ex-Soviet artist who migrated to New York um, in the late 70s. And so this kind of resonance and unexpected discoveries before uh, critics and artists and art history, honestly, was able to catch up was kind of a revelation for me. And I always think of art historian uh, Helen Mossworth, um, evocation of this methodology of understanding and writing history uh, when she approached um, writing about the New York art world in the 1980s and 90s that the, the game of history of politics of love to figure out how the clock strike differently without losing time and I think that is quite fitting for our topic today because communism is not just a political or ideological concept, it's also a temporal one, right? And we um, come from very different um, lineages and cultural as well as pedagogical backgrounds. Um, and I think that the artists who are present today um, r represent that really rich spectrum. So without further delay, I want to move to Anton, who's been working, uh, dedicating his time uh, and a lot of energy in the past two, three years. Six. Six years, okay, on Russian com cosmism. And um, I think this is perhaps the first time you're introducing that in Hong Kong. So why don't you tell a little bit um, about what is Russian cosmism um, and what does it mean for you as an artist to approach it as opposed to like an historian? Does it mean interesting revelations or opening a, a new can of worms? Thank you so much. And I think, uh, um, you know, one of the things that always fascinated me, and perhaps not only me, but, you know, this is like a, quite a big academic topic, uh, historical topic. Why did the communist revolution happen in Russia? You know, because in a way, you know, uh, communism and Marxism are very kind of progressive modernist. Um, I did, it, it's a progressive modernist ideology that uh, requires educated uh, working class that requ requires a certain degree of emancipation on the part of the proletariat in order for the revolution to to happen. And of course, Russia at at the beginning of 20th century was not one of the most well-educated places in the world. It was actually quite backward. The, I think the literacy rate was under 20% compared to, for example, in Germany, I think Germany achieved a, a, a literacy rate of something close to 90% at the same time. So there is always, it was also not the most developed capitalism. I think it was quite more developed in, in Great Britain at the time. So there is always this question, why, why did the revolution take place in, uh, in a country that was so much more backward 
compared to other Western European uh, countries. And, you know, related to this question, you know, at a certain point I came across a very unusual philosophy that originated around the same time um, in, in the second part of 19th century in Russian Empire, which um, was basically something um, quite related to communism and shared a lot of um, ideas and beliefs and, and, and sentiments of it, but was also a little bit different. Yeah, uh, These days, uh, uh, people refer to this philosophy as Russian cosmism. Uh, at the time when it was first kind of uh, developed, which is 1860s, 1870s, it did not have a specific name. It was developed by a, a very unusual person, a very um, a modest person who was basically a librarian most of his life. His name was Nikolai Fedorov. Uh, he was a son of a, a, of an aristocrat, but uh, he was an illegitimate child, so he did not inherit a title or a very big fortune. He received a reasonably good education, but then basically worked as a kind of a very uh, basic school teacher and then a librarian in one of the libraries in Moscow for the rest of his life. And then so at a certain point in 1860s, 1870s, he develops this completely remarkable idea that evolutionary were not complete because we're mortal, yeah? And that death is basically a kind of a flaw in our design that we can and have to correct using uh, our unique capacities for reason, technology, uh, science, art, and other sort of yeah, intellectual disciplines that, that humanity is capable of. That we should not wait for God to resurrect us as is traditionally held uh, in 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 the uh, in Christianity, yes, basically, because Christianity offers uh, promises you an immortal life of the soul, which is kind of given to you by God. So basically, what Fedorov proposed is to completely supersede this and achieve immortality ourselves by uh, human means through our capacity for technology, science, and, and, and thinking and reason. And uh, then he basically suggested that, well, it would be very, very selfish to only become immortal ourselves. And because we owe the sort of this Im immense debt to all of the previous generations that came before us, to our parents, our grandparents, their parents, and so forth, that we have a moral obligation to resurrect all of them. Every human being who ever lived, starting maybe with Adam and Eve, who in 19th century Christians believe that they are the, the, the first humans, yeah? Um, then he kind of uh, suggested that m maybe it will be so many people that this planet is not going to be able to support such an enormous population of immortal beings. So he advocated development of space travel, uh, research into spaceships and rockets, colonization of other planets, exploration of the galaxy and the universe, and basically wrote uh, four volumes of essays and various writing in the most radical, futuristic, and un unexpected sort of direction. Um, and basically, while he never taught formally and while he never published in his uh, during his life, yeah, for a number of reasons. Somehow his ideas circulated within the uh, uh, circle of uh, Russian intelligentsia, so he actually was quite influential on uh, such writers as Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and Tolstoy used to visit him in, at the library where Fedorov worked almost every month, and they had kind of long conversations. So a lot of ideas that uh, were kind of developed by Fedorov somehow entered into uh, certain works of literature, poetry, and then, of course, visual art. And um, basically, during the revolution and after the revolution, uh, these kinds of ideas from uh, developed first by Fedorov, but then by a whole circle of uh, intellectuals that thought in the same way, uh, became very, very appealing to... to uh, this kind of post-revolutionary first generation of this utopian sort of communist and utopian socialist in the Soviet Union for uh, a number of reasons. One is, of course, that it just maybe when you create an event as transformative as, as a revolution where private property suddenly gets completely abolished yeah, and a new society comes into being, 
in almost a completely miraculous way, it must make you think that, you know, there is nothing impossible and perhaps immortality, resurrection, uh, travel in space do not seem such uh, fantastical projects. They seem maybe as real as, you know, something that was just, that just transpired. But also at the base of, uh, at the base of, uh, cos of Russian cosmism, of Fedorov's philosophy, there is a kind of a very, very strong materialism, which is quite similar to the kind of materialism that exists in, in Marxism. Um, so the two uh, ideologies or two philosophies were actually quite sympathetic to each other. Also, Fedorov realized that such immense project as uh, resurrection of everybody who ever lived cannot be accomplished under capitalism because it's just economically not efficient enough uh, to, to generate sufficient economy, resources, possibilities for such a tremendous, tremendous project. So the society that he describes where immortality and resurrection becomes possible is actually something quite similar to a communist society. There is no longer private property, there is no longer production of luxury or, or consumption of luxury. Uh, everybody uh, kind of exists in a very egalitarian way. Um, labor is maybe the, the most important sort of value in, the, in this society, yeah, because resurrection and immortality is achieved through human labor, yeah, so it becomes almost divine in its, in its uh, potential. And um, basically at this time, m it seems that most of artists within the Soviet avant-garde are tremendously influenced by these ideas. And it, it, when I started sort of looking into this, it seems that it's more difficult to find uh, a, a radical artist of the spirit who is not influenced by Fedorov or by Cosmism uh, than you know, uh, just count the ones that were directly, that directly mentioned it in their diaries or their work. So you can talk about Malevich or Lisitsky, you can talk about Eisenstein, you can talk about just about a anybody within kind of a form of advanced cultural practices that were developed at the time that were tremendously influenced by these ideas. By early 1930s, Stalin puts an end to all of this, because what happens in the Soviet Union is a certain consolidation of a very particular version of communism, yeah, almost similar to what happened with Christianity in the fourth century, where a canon is developed and anything that is not conforming to this particular canon is considered to be heretical and the subject to persecution, uh, censorship or erasure, yeah? So basically after 1931 or 1932, it becomes extremely dangerous to speak about any of these ideas, to make paintings or to, you know, write music or make films that has these themes in, in them. And basically the entire, entire uh, paradigm of cosmism kind of is hidden and, and disappears from knowledge, from memory for a very, very long time. It doesn't reappear until, let's say, late 1960s, early 1970s. And it's quite interesting that even though it is still not officially allowed in the Soviet Union, it seems a lot of leading intellectuals, people like, for example, the filmmaker Tarkovsky, are extremely familiar with these ideas because they quote them verbatim in their works and their films. So even though these books have not been published yet, somehow manuscript circulates and there is a kind of awareness of this in scientific and also in the artistic circles. And then uh, basically only after the, f the end of the Soviet Union uh, in the early 1990s uh, do these works finally see kind of publication and start getting translated in other languages. And only now there is a little bit of an awareness that there was a kind of a massive cultural intellectual movement that influenced so much of the of the most advanced cultural production of the time that is completely excluded from the historical narrative of modernism, from um, kind of understanding of the development of art uh, of that period and of you know contemporary art as well. So in a way, I'm working with this material partly as a researcher 
partly as an artist, I've made several films that uh, deal with these ideas. They're not uh, documentaries, they're more artistic films. But also as a publisher, with, uh, to, uh, jointly with Boris Groys and a number of other artists and intellectuals, we have published several uh, books. Uh, some of them are historical translation of the original texts, which have largely have not been translated to English or many other languages, but also some contemporary reflection of these ideas, because at this moment, uh, a lot of the things that Cosmos were thinking about in the 1920s or even at the end of 19th century are actually becoming technologically possible. And with the latest developments in biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and other advanced fields of uh, science and technology, um, the idea of uh, prolongation of uh, human lifespan or even certain kind of maybe perpetual life, is not completely out, a complete fantasy, yeah? And of course, a lot of, you know, this kind of new oligarchs in California, such people like Peter Thiel and things like that, are quite enamored of these ideas and are really pumping quite a lot of money into research, into rejuvenation, immortality, and, and, and so forth which gives a lot of urgency, at least for me as, as an artist or as, as, as a you know, political being, in dealing with these ideas, because the, the, the scary scenario yeah, is that this technology will be developed, but it will only be available for billionaires and oligarchs, the rich and the powerful. The consequences of that will be that the oppression will become indefinite. Yeah? Uh, Russian cosmists could not conceive of immortality as an individual, um, as something for an individual. It was really always immortality for all. It was not so much about their own immortality, but, but, but immortality and resurrection to all of the victims of history, to, to the, for the others, for the community. Yeah? So for me, it's quite important to, 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 to try to bring this understanding of, of, of uh, the uh, Russian cosmos into the contemporary discourse, not to let it to be hijacked by kind of technological right wing of, you know, Peter Thiel and the likes. So I think maybe this is a good place to stop. Yeah, thank you for that very comprehensive introduction. I do want to... Uh, go deeper into your own practice and your film uh, made um, in conjunction with this research. For the, for the sake of time, let's move a little bit forward in time from end of 19th century or even, you know, 1917 to mid-century China and, and to our next panelist, Huang Rui, who um, was one of the founders of the STARS group of uh, amateurish artists and poets and uh, cultural pr practitioners, and you were also one of the founding members of this publication today. Um, and when we were speaking in preparation for this panel, you spoke of um, you know, all of these um, foreign literature and uh, artistic forms that you were introducing through translation and through uh, very spontaneous discussion and discourse generation among the artists. So why don't uh, you comment a little bit about that? And you mentioned there are even um, some uh, you know, poets from the Soviet period that was influential because the stars artists were not academy artists who were practicing this kind of uh, socialist realism that was also very much impacted by the Soviet paradigm and system of training. So it is would like you to discuss and also uh, the stars society and what kind of, um, what kind of uh, things you discuss and translate and focus on all the schools of thought and, and painting, for example, what kind, of, um, what kind of impact it has on your uh, organization and uh, uh, activities as such. Uh, when I was invited to this symposium, it is kind of a joke. <laughs> I, s I looked at the, the topic. It is probably one of the most politici politicized. Um, one thing also mentioned feminism, but I think feminism, we can, it, we can, talk, we can talk, frame it in a non-political way. But communism, you cannot frame it otherwise. And Communism 
um, is also a kind of uh, politics. So when we talk about either communism or communism in China, every single day, uh, when we be, when we wake up in the morning, as soon as you leave your personal space, you will have to think about it. It's, it's the setting. Every no matter how minute your the topic is, the issue is it, it keeps you thinking. It, it, it needs to be addressed by you, and you need to have to respond to this. So this, especially in for some intellectuals, some cultural figures, or artists, it's kind of a it's, it weighs down upon them every single second. So why don't we just say it as it is? It's authoritarianism. So uh, for people like us who, who create, who do art, it stands in opposition to us. We have a reason. Oh, we, 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 we have. So, so, so Russia transformed into Soviet Union, and Soviet Union helped, helped China uh, onto the path of an idealized path towards modernization. Towards when we were very young, we we. we, we, we when I started, uh, when I was started to to get in, to, to to become interested in art, I was very little. When I was still like perhaps seven, three to four years old, I started learning to paint, and no other. The only option was to paint uh, traditional Chinese ink art. Sixties, uh, Chairman Mao wanted to start a cultural revolution, and ink art was banned. So we had no other option but to learn uh, Western, Western art material and techniques of Western art. So when I started, the first thing I picked up was how to paint a portraiture of Mao. Because I lived in Beijing, it's a little bit of personal history. I was living in Beijing and was in elementary school. I was pretty good. I was very well-behaving elementary school student, so I was always selected to go to Tiananmen and to be, you know, uh, be seen by Mao and received by Mao. And and so, at my age, I have seen Mao four times. People were so surprised. They thought, because I, I start to be, to to be able to meet a Chairman Mao since I was 11 years old. The third time, I was really, really feeling disgusted. So. I felt nauseous. He wanted to see me, but I didn't want to see him. Why? Because all those kids that saw Mao together with me, they were crying. They thought, they thought Mao was God, was not one of our humankind. And I didn't, Mao told us there was no such thing as God. But the kids, ever, you know, kids around me, ever since when they started to burst into either laughter or, and then from laughter to tears, it was what we call communism. I would say it's kind of a collectivism manifested in Chinese uh, society. Uh, because I, I was really affected by that. I started to have goosebumps, and I couldn't cry because all the other kids were crying. So I looked quite alternative, and I was starting to reflecting on my alternative way of life. And then start, I had to go back, and I had to go home really quietly, and I didn't want to participate in this kind of political activities anymore. And, and then Russia. Came along. I never was exposed to such things. Um, my uncle, my maternal uncle, that was, I was 30, my maternal uncle brought home C.S. Uh, long player 
um, from uh, of Swan Lake from Russian Opera, and I thought it was sound from heaven. It was a call for freedom. So ever since then, from Tchaikovsky onwards, I start move on to uh, Beethoven. In secret, you not you, you really cannot be known to have listened to this. We had kids listening to these because because. As long as the adults were not there, you listen to this music. Ever since then, I started to believe that I do not want to do socialism, Maoism, or communism. I want to do all, away with all of them. What I could possibly do is to seek. And I encountered a different kind of setting. There were lots of people that were trying to seek. Uh, you can see the pictures. A lot of young people were sitting. You, have, you see Beda, the poet. He was probably three years or four years you know, older than I. He Ever since the Cultural Revolution, a lot of young people started to write poetry. And they were, they were aware a little bit earlier than I. I mean, if I were really, really into painting, I would start it when I was a child. I didn't know how to do it. How, how to, to paint in your own way? For them, they, when they already started to write poetry in their own manner. Uh, Manke wrote a poem, uh, Beidao Manke. And I, we, uh, in 1978, we started to find the. Uh, <coughs> I'm actually checking time. I'm so sorry. I'm a bit distracted. Um, we found it today. So, what was the focus of this uh, today? Of course, ever since the Cultural Revolution, we could, we could read translated literature, especially uh, Mayakovsky or Akhmatova, uh, my favorite Russian or uh, Soviet Russian uh, poetry. But, but back then, we, we could actually recite them because. In his early, before he got desperate about Soviet Union, he actually sang high praise for the new phenomena in Soviet society. So we were, we, we were young, we needed something new, like new revolutionary spirit, or a re rebellious tribe. So these were all intertwined. So later I discovered there were a lot of cheating in there. There was a lot of... Um, so, um, when we were, uh, me and other uh, young painters, we were not so early in our... Uh, we, we came to this quite late, in the early 70s. We were still not aware of uh, contemporary art. We knew a little bit about you know, the post-impressionism, Cubism, we knew, of course, about Picasso and all, we, limited information, you know, but maybe serendipity or whatever sources, uh, we, 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 we were able to have a lot of exposure to uh, introductions to Russian literature and art. So we kind of Insert, interplay this into the so-called revolutionary spirit of my early um, work, Yuan Ming Yuan, for example, and all these uh, standing um, limbs, you know, or like skeletons. This whole work, Yuan Ming Yuan, was a um, palace of the imperial Qing emper emperors. It was basically destroyed by the, um, in the Second Opium War by the Russian, um, uh, sorry, by the, by the um, English, French uh, war, soldiers. And then the second time it was actually destroyed by the um, armies of 1900. So well, my, my technique back then was still uh, exposed to, well, let's say, adopted a certain Russian style, uh, sort of expressiveness, certain fantasy, a little bit of symbolism. Uh, of course, it uh, wasn't the same anymore. 
Well, in a way, I think we can uh, continue. Um, we can. There are so many different threads that we can follow through, and I'm just brewing with so many follow-up questions. And, but, but I think I can see the same for Vivek. Uh, there must be so many things you're already picking up on. But for the sake of introducing your practice and a little bit of your background to the audience, uh, maybe we can start by. Um, Speaking of where you come from and the, the local condition, and you're from Kerala, that has a strong communist legacy still. And but but in comparison to these two artists, who seem to have there seems to be uh, a degree of heaviness or struggle or existentialism um, when we speak about this difficult legacy of communism. It, do you feel the same way, or not so much? Well, not so much. <laughs> But, I, I mean, I can understand that. But uh, for us, it was uh, like growing up in a, a kind of, uh, what is it, uh, a kind of town, an industrial township uh, in, in Kerala. And we had, like my dad was a, a trade union leader. And he was quite well read and we had a nice library. I was talking with a friend of mine about that. Can you Le speak a bit louder? Oh, yeah? To okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we, we had, uh, Dad used to read quite well, and we had these libraries, and we used to get uh, magazines from China, like China Reconstructs, and uh, two magazines from Ch China, I don't remember the other one. Uh, then What time was this? What decade? Uh, it was 70s, uh, uh, I mean late 70s, uh, and magazines from the Soviet Union also, like Soviet land, and so uh, so many things. And also there were bookshops selling Soviet literature, amazing uh, books on science and, and art and uh, stories and all that. I mean, as kids. Uh, so that was like an initiation into this. Then later on we got to read other uh, like Soviet literature. And not so much from China, but uh, the Soviet, uh, they had a, a wing. I mean, like you used to get these heavy books with uh, very cheap. I mean, like cheaper than uh, the normal... Uh, European or American publications, and, and for me, uh, growing up was like rebelling against the kind of ideas that your dad was trying to uh, tell you. I mean, like, so, so in my works there are these things making s not fun of, but a kind of peculiar situation that uh, is a reality in in some way. But it is also quite ironical, and it can be quite funny if you if you see it like that. But uh, it can also be in such a way that they might hate it, but they cannot... Uh, it, it is truth. It is a truth. A kind of a truth. So, so I, mean, I don't know if you can pause these pictures, but there are... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll no, I'm sure saying, we can't the, pause any of those. No, I wish no. we can speak pointedly <laughs> to them, but yeah. maybe we can start by this really uh, very humorous project you did of these um, Indian people, Indian nationals, who were named after... Lenin, Stalin. Yeah, yeah. There's one woman who was named uh, Soviet after Breeze. Soviet Breeze, yeah. uh, which was very poetic, but also I bizarre. <laughs> I want to hear more about that. Yeah, that was one of my first works that really uh, got my practice going in the sense like I, I was interested in how people access these kind of ideas and how they internalize it and how they construct their identity using these ideas. Mostly that, that has been my way of seeing, whether it was or color, or I mean, um, art historical references, or all that. That has been mostly what what I've been practicing. So this was uh, a friend of mine said his son's name was Gramsci. So then I knew, like the the rest, I knew that they are there. I mean, you, you knew one Lenin or a Stalin, uh, <laughs> but Gramsci was like I thought it's time to do a work on that. So I had photographed a friend. So with Breeze was a find. I mean, like, I didn't I didn't know somebody was there like that. So I called it like Between One Shore and Several Others. So that has been like a, a title of uh, like 10 of my shows. And this was the work that started it. I mean, like. And how long have you been working on the series if it continues to transform in different exhibitions and you continue to take in more components and observations because even the title implies a multitude of... Um, interests and explorations and yeah I, I think that the interests are uh, 
there are many interests i mean uh, but it is a similar pattern of looking at it it's just what i look at it i am able to transform it into the kind of uh, ideas that i use as tools to see it so it's mostly like there is this last supper gaza uh, i don't know whether you can see the title uh, where these oh, women that image are, of the women woman yeah. post in yeah. da vinci's last supper yeah. and composition the, the funny thing was when i showed it in madrid uh, gaza was attacked the next day <laughs> the same day or something and uh, i mean i had done for a different purpose like talking to a friend of mine from there uh, who they did not get much opportunities to show us like indian artists like somebody from gaza who is has a jordanian passport and was living in dubai and and practicing art anyway so oh, this, uh, this is, is that yeah this is that work yeah and this, this one is also done in in uh, it's like vision after the sermon after gogan i mean this is happening in in uh, in front of marx's grave in london uh, so yes th- there are uh, this was again uh, done with holograms like where most of the products come from china and uh, uh there was a time when there was a peasant revolution in uh, in india and what, what year a peasant revolution i mean yeah, i mean uh, when what year was that it was in the 60s uh-huh. so i think uh, mao was informed and then he says this famous quotation that uh, i can hear the spring thunder let a thousand flowers bloom and uh, and suddenly what you what is so i did these mouse this thing with with these holograms like like a thousand flowers like suddenly most of the products are uh were coming from there and, the, and the, of course the peasant revolution is still is still happening there are uh, people who believe in that ideology and are uh, having struggles and fights also Yeah, I have a question for all of you because yesterday when Vivek and I were speaking a little bit in anticipation of this I asked him um how does the sort of communist legacy reconcile with uh the, the deep religiosity in Indian communities and is that a conflict or not and in today's remarks um Anton you were speaking about uh, almost a, a, a kind of divine resurrection and you were speaking of the holy trinity as a model for Fedorov and Juan Rui was speaking of Mao almost as a divine figure and so it seems like religion or at least metaphors of this uh, the potency of of religious um religious potency and i i am just wondering how you guys um respond to that kind of common thread that's unexpectedly developing here yeah i mean one of the things that surprised me quite a bit in in this last few years of um yeah of the research that i did for my project is that actually it seems that there was not you know the first decade after the revolution and the few years that preceded it were so incredibly eclectic and experimental it was really not a contradiction to be a deeply religious person and to be a communist and to be a cosmist and to be a member of some kind of anthroposophical society or a masonic lodge and somehow it was a very very fluid situation you know russian orthodox church in the year after the revolution in 1918 actually endorsed uh, communism because in a way it reflected a lot of kind of communal uh, christian sort of yeah traditions that they they didn't really at first they didn't feel that their uh in competition yeah they they felt that there was some kind of affinity so they did not uh you know they did not position themselves they did not speak out against it yeah so but of course this kind of very fluid situation does not last very long yeah basically by the end of 1920s whatever space for difference within the sort of the, the mainstream of the soviet union ideological mainstream really narrows down and basically only scientific marxism is allowed to to exist officially yeah but 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 of course most of the artwork and most of the literature poetry all of this amazingly shaping things that completely shaped the culture and art of 20th and 21st century come from that decade where there is this incredible fluidity and 
yeah, crossover between yeah, religion, ideology, communism, and yeah, many other things. No, for, for us, it was uh, a lot of poets and uh, writers and musicians and I mean, a lot of creative people were there with the communists to, to start with. And uh, this was, uh, see, we, we were not, uh, there was other parties also, like there was the Congress party and uh, there were a lot of uh, labor was being organized uh, in, in certain areas in, in the state. And because of that, they formed another party uh, that had some affinity towards communism. Like they formed a socialist party, and then the socialists broke away and became communists, uh, big com communist party of India, Marxist. So uh, they had a base of Congress, the other, the labor uh, in in the party, like s transforming themselves into a, a socialist party and then becoming a Marxist party. So. It was uh, it was a different route that we we took, and that is why they won it by the election. And uh, if, of course, uh, the government was dismissed in two two years when America pumped in a lot of money because there was Vietnam, there was something happening, there was Indonesia, everywhere it was flaring up, for, according to them. So they tried their best, and through the church, they got some disturbance in the state and. Uh, uh, Nehru uh, d dismissed the government. So, uh, religion did not play. People see that sort of. It was very porous. I mean, they were they were not religious, obviously. So then the church was. Uh, um, they said that this is the anti-religious party, and soon they'll close down churches and uh, look what has happened in China or Russia. Or <laughs> uh, so we we don't know what's happening there, but uh, this was what. Uh, I mean, the church was uh, uh, trying to create some disturbance. Uh, because in Kerala, we have, uh, like, it's not just the Hindus might be a bit uh, more than the others, but we have a strong um, Islamic and uh, Christian population too. Yeah. But uh, uh, they were for it. I mean, it was a very positive thing, uh, the, what the Marxists brought about in, uh, in the beginning. I mean. Now, because mostly most of the uh, leaders are all just uh, Marxians, not because of any kind of work they have done, it's mostly what they have read. So a lot of people are moving away from this uh, uh, ideology. Yeah. And it is more like, a, and the extreme uh, <laughs> left or the Maoists, are, they're a think tank. I mean, like, more than they do anything. Yeah. So in, in Kerala, it's a different uh, setup, yeah. But they are like the conscious of, con uh, like, conscience of the people, in a way. Yeah. Like, they, they write to the press or like that, you know, it's, it's done in very democratic uh, terms. Then it sounds very similar to what Anton just described, and uh, I asked you that question more or less out of my own ignorance, because, it, no, it's true, because um, when when you said that this, my perception of this deep religiosity uh, of Indian communities is a myth, I, I'm, I'm speaking from a Chinese perspective, from like a deeply secular society, and I think that could transition very interestingly to what uh, Huang Rui might talk about because you you compared you know certain political leaders to a divine like figure but we never had we never really had um religion like the the, the russian orthodox church or um islam or um hinduism even and buddhism is more interpreted as a philo philosophy here uh, i might be wrong in that regard so i i'm curious what you might say uh, I would continue to, to speak in Chinese. If one says that there's no religion, then it might not necessarily be so, because it is in the last couple of years that this has happened when I was small. All of Beijing, meaning my neighbors, you know, all of the uh, alleys and streets, you know, that are around us, all of them are Buddhist uh, monasteries. Some of them are Taoist. When I was small, in the 50s in Beijing, there was still 
within the second ring, 500 plus of monasteries. This is shown on the map. And there, also, there were also some small uh, family um, institutions or, or um, an ancestries that are uh, around the corners. Uh, say some are uh, lamas and uh, monasteries, but all of these things, all of these have been ruined. So the, the, that ruining is to replace religious uh, belief, and hence we are talking about this uh, topic of communism. Now, this is actually what we say that when communism occurs or evolves, uh, you know, at the beginning we have um, revolutionary uh, ideals. I heard a lot of that about when I was small. And uh, our Indian friends have been talking about this. You know, uh, for those who have um, revolutionary dreams, they would tend to merge or evolve into uh, um, people who have creativity and you know, people who would like to achieve results. They would evolve into something else, and I do not object to this uh, line of thinking. Now, our current Chinese leaders, they are, we are of the same generation. Uh, however, they they have been uh, activists at the uh, beginning of the Cultural Revolution, whereas I have been a very passive uh, role at the beginning of that era. And that's a big difference here. These activists, you know, actually have also been penalized during the end, uh, during that period. Uh, however, uh, revolution, uh, uh, political uh, um, revolution never stops. Every three years, you have a new cycle. Now, apart from one or two uh, leaders um, that you cannot keep, like um, John and I, you know, the other leaders have all been replaced by Mao. So the, the previous generations of revolutionists has also been uh, ejected. You know, just like uh, Ai Weiwei's family had been, um, you know, ejected to uh, Xinjiang, some to Shanxi. So that's actually the activist at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Now, I don't want to name them, but I basically know them all. Now they're back now. So. To pursue a revolutionary, a revolutionary a, a ideal, a dream is in their blood. You know, it, the pacifist, you know, like um, you know, passive practitioners like me, you know, probably would be happy with just creating some art. We won't have a, a lot of uh, big impact, nor do we have any good impact. You know, people often say that I have bad influences to the community. However, I feel that my influence is very limited because I only work on my artistic work. Uh, so, you know, so that uh, my, uh, my gallery, you know, can continue and I can sleep there. Yeah. <laughs> It's as if you were anticipating my next question because well, 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 you're not done. Okay. I know, let me continue. Our idea of communism actually happens in that age, in that era. Uh, that was in 1978. The following year, uh, I initiated the Xinxin movement. At that time, our constitution allows freedom of gathering, so we wanted to have some kind of uh, association. And through this uh, collective uh, energy, we can you know, bring some differences to the society. Now, this kind of freedom at the beginning of the 80s had been taken away. The, I think it's around 1983 when the freedom to uh, uh, of association had been taken away from the constitution. So you need to know, prior to 1983, the series of cultural, scientific, artistic 
Experimenting to find its own languages, including uh, a feeling of the cosmos, a feeling of the world. However, they have been replaced like that. So, uh, like our association, since definitely was replaced. Now, what we face is with um, uh, those policies and slogans. Under communism and communism, you know that you know, we are being led at this time. That means between the collective and the person and the individual. Is there any further space? You know, to me, this remains a question. So, just going back to what your comments was inspiring me to ask, and also in relation to the context of the art fair, is just too obvious a question not to ask. Um, in, in terms of art and uh, political agency um, and radicalism, I don't know if it was trans he was speaking of Jijin, which should be translated to rat radicalism. And this is the question for you all. So for Anton, do you think through your own practice and research, d do you think resurrecting uh, cosmism in this way restores um, new possibilities or some potency in art in this inescapable capitalist condition that we have to continue to work with. So Huang Rui commented, Ai Weiwei is a radical artist. But l let's wait to hear what Anton has to say about this. And because you already commented a little bit on the defeat, maybe, that you feel that you can no longer be as, mm, you know, uh, political as you were, just because of this, this context, you're making works for the market, you're making works that adheres to a different set of values than you had probably intended. And, and for Vivek, um, you seem to be the least burdened by maybe by this moral uh, conundrum. Maybe I'm wrong in perceiving that because you, you seem to have a lightness and humor, a humorous approach to all of this. Sorry, my question is very long, and m maybe we'll start with Anton. Can you repeat the question? Oh, just, yeah. uh, well, because so, when, we, when we speak of communism, even in, in Marxist context, there is uh, a utopian ideal to radically transform power relations and uh, abolishment of private property, and, uh, and that's very relevant to our modes of artistic production today. And it, is, that agenda, is that agenda something you wanted to resurrect for um, your resurrection of cosmism, or, uh, or did they even consider the role of art for the public um, in Fedorov's um, original conception? Were there any writings or comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but one of the things that maybe attracted me immediately to Fedorov in a way that was maybe much stronger than any kind of attraction I felt to any other philosophical or theoretical ideas before is that he gives art and artists enormous importance and power. You know, m most of philosophy and ideology treat art and culture in general as something that's only marginally important, you know, f and this is f for many reasons. For one reason, you know, philosophy and theory exist in the realm of ideas, and, you know, while artists still work with materials, and materials are perceived to be, it's still the stuff, you know, like, yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of uh, philosophers really only consider uh, aesthetics and art at the very end of their life and don't really kind of invest too much work into it and so forth. So Fedorov was completely different. He treats art on the same, on par with science, religion, technology, the most advanced forms and, and activities of, of humanity. For him, art is as important to the process of resurrection and immortality as, as medicine, yeah, and just as urgent, yeah. In fact, for him, art is a kind of a technology of immortality. So, if, uh, 
you know, it's kind of difficult sometimes to uh, work with certain set of ideas and, and kind of study them without, uh, only from the outside, because I'm not an academic and I'm not, you know, so I can't just study something as a specimen in, in, a, in, in a laboratory and not be contaminated by, um, by the subject of my research. And I think probably, you know, over the last few years, I have been infected by some of this, uh, ideas uh, for radical transformation of society and for uh, a belief in a form of art that has enormous power to to transform. Yeah. So yes, in a way, I would the, the answer would be yes. If Juan Ray and Vivek have something to respond to that, can I ask you to limit your response to maybe? Uh, two minutes each, and then we can have pick a lucky member in the audience to ask something maybe provocative to all of us. No, for, for me, uh, I mean, uh, after a long time, I had resolved that I'm not an activist. And uh, through the kind of things that I'm saying, I, I may not be able to uh, change much. So then I thought the next thing is to point at things and art was one vehicle for that. And uh, so I could point at things that interest me or I want uh, and also to bring it to a, uh, objectify it and bring it to a kind of discourse uh, at least in, in, in an area that uh, it might get some some air. So that is what I was uh, my, my practice is mostly about. Uh, yeah. Do you have any comments? Uh, two minutes maximum. Uh, I have just one minute anyway. So, uh, one of my le most recent works uh, is focused on within the space, a given space, uh, the structural changes within the space. So this is kind of an abstract thing, but uh, I also try to inject uh, some, temporal, some information related to time, uh, like a macro-historical time, for example. Um, I believe that that's all I can achieve because uh, people who have experienced similar stuff uh, are still active artists in their field and they are very, very experienced. So, uh, changes in time, we can raise questions to them, we can, we can also uh, get, grasp the point of such think, changes in, in time. I probably can be, have, I have probably a surer hand in comparison to younger artists. When I do more abstract things and, and try and enter, uh, inject some sort of uh, historical material and key landmarks in time uh, into the abstract items that I've been working on to every Chinese pers uh, person. Uh, we kind of participate in a human history. It's kind of the common concerns and from, uh, sort of uh, relegated to oblivion by time or memories of time. That's kind of uh, what I um, was interested in. <laughs> Actually, okay. you used a minute and a half. We have about six minutes, and uh, we would really like to take a question from the audience if we have any curiosity. Yes, please. Wait for the mic. Sorry, uh, Huang Rei used the word authoritarianism. And I would ask, in this era of Putin, Xi Jinping, and Modi, what art is coming out that is being a reaction to that? In a way, that sort of authoritarianism creates art. What would you say about that? Uh, actually, Modi doesn't have much impact in, in the place that I come from. But uh, def definitely, no, 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 no. I'm, yeah, Modi is a big disaster. Like it is. Uh, uh, and uh, art cannot do much against 
uh, people who think like that. I think the, there will be there are other people who will take action. I think uh, artists are. It is very. It's a very peculiar situation. Like uh, there, there was some artist's work that was pulled down and uh, burnt, and uh, somebody had to leave the country, and uh, all these things are are going on. Uh, but I think the elections. He will go next uh, after in a year or something. No, uh, like uh, the kind of works that I did uh, just a few years ago, I may not be able to do it now, or uh, no one wants to show those kind of works. So there are there are problems like that. Yeah. So then we talk about other other problems, like Modi will be handled by the elect electorate, uh, but the problem is. Uh, Different states have different priorities and different politics and and all that. Like we, so that is where sometimes we think like a, a kind of a communism or a Marxism or some kind of a conscience that these guys were unlucky that they didn't have. Actually, so if they had even a bit of it, like I, I was photographing some of these riot victims' wounds and creating a, a, a landscape with these wounds. So they told me to get away from there. Uh, so, and that was supposed to be shown in Gujarat, like where Modi was campaigning at that time. So the uh, the people who were helping me, they said, uh, "You watch too closely. I mean, better leave." Yeah. <laughs> then I showed it in Bombay. I mean, like, which is not the place to show. But uh, anyway. So I think we have to do it through. Uh, that is one good thing. Whether it is communism or uh, Modi or anyone comes, when you you have the ballot. Then you can throw them out next time, unless they capture power and then become totalitarian. I mean, no, no one should uh, like that. Should not be the dictatorship of anybody. Well, it is. It, it can go wrong. I mean, like, and it is shown that it will go wrong. Sorry. You have. You have. You have. Okay, so Anton. Do you have any response to that, Anton? Do you have any response to that? Okay. Do we have another question? There is one in the back. Sorry. Um, I'll make this quick. I'm interested in how everyone seemed to formulate a localized identity with how their art has developed. And I was wondering, no, I was actually more interested in how this really does reveal the cracks of some sort of totemic art institution. And I was thinking of what you guys each individually thought is missing in institutions in your local situations. I think the most important thing is that what you do as an artist, you don't have to focus on what you actually supply into the society at large. I have been critical of my setting non-stop, and I need, it's just like taking a shower in the morning, you go to the restroom to relieve some of the issues. Because there's a lot of unfreedom, non-healthy, or let's say uh, low, uncivilized, uncomfortable things in your setting. Yet, it is likely to exert an impact on you, for example. In Beijing, for example, it's probably a little bit better. Pollution is really, really atrocious, but it still remains at a distance from your artistic creation. Uh, in, uh, my uh, PPT, 
uh, slides, uh, mostly focused on uh, works that I created in the 70s and the 80s in the political setting was even worse, much, much worse than it is now. I'm not saying that all the pressure uh, was brought to the artist, may all give the artist a kind of attitude. I think the artist needs individual answer from his own bosom okay, of his heart. Okay, and on that note, I will just conclude by saying that I'm humbled by your presence. I've certainly learned a lot, and I hope that we've given you guys a lot to think about, hopefully. And thank you for being here and joining us.